The other day, Tony and I were reminiscing on all the different seasons. I coached him in sports. I coached my boys' teams a lot because there were times then I didn't, and I would get very frustrated with how poorly the teams were doing due to the coaching. And I could tell how aggravated my kids were with the losing, especially Tony. When we first moved here, I didn't jump right in coaching the kids because I previously coached high school and college guys, and I have somewhat of a intense, is that a good way to put it, Bobby, an intense style, and I didn't know if it would work well with little kids, but then this happened, and uh, this is Tony's uh, coming off the field after a loss, his first year at Parks and Rec. Uh, how many people can remember that face over the years seeing that one? Yes. So, uh, no amount of good jobs or end-of-the-game snacks would appease that mood. And all the way home in the car, we would hear all about it. We suck, and this kid wasn't doing this right, and this kid kept doing that wrong, and the coach doesn't know how to coach, and we're not learning how to play the game right. And I would sit there and drive and go, yeah, yeah, that's true. I, I agree with everything you're saying. So the next season, I figured maybe I'd better step up and coach Tony. And this is Tony, uh, the first year that I coached him. This is the next year when, when Dad started coaching. So having a much better experience, I don't know, can you, can you go back to that next slide there? Uh, the next slide, yeah, can you see the difference? I don't know, is that a little bit noticeable there? Uh, having a much better experience. So it's typical for us as parents to want to fix things and make things better for our children. If it's within our ability and our power to solve a problem and make them happy, of course we want to do it. It's pretty easy when they're little. You can do all kinds of stuff for them. You can make a whole lot of decisions on their behalf that you know is going to work out for everyone's best. But, you know, the older they get, Robert, the older they get, then you have a lot less say. And uh, they, you have a lot less power. And uh, it's much harder to start fixing things. So for my older sons, I'm pretty much all I can do for them is advise them and pray for them. I have no authority anymore over what they're doing with their lives. I can't jump in and fix things when, like I used to when they were little. And you know, that is kind of really how I feel about my entire ministry experience. So often people are hurting and struggling, and I seem like I have very little power to fix things or make things better. It, 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 all I seem like I can do is just advise and then pray. But in my head, I'm thinking, if I could make you do this or say that, if I could get you to stop this behavior, but rather make you do these things, if I could control you, then I could really fix a lot of these struggles in your life. Or if I had the power to heal people, if I could do miracles and cure the sick and relieve pain and cast out demons and conjure up instant money and resources, wow, it'd be so easy to fix all the things that my, my people are struggling with if I just had the power. You ever thought that way? I, I wish I had the authority to just speak and say it, and it would be done. Some churches actually teach that, don't they? It's called the Word of Faith movement, yet you speak things into reality. Your faith is like a force, and you can conjure up whatever you want from the universe with your faith force. It's very Star Wars kind of theology there. So that's not true. I don't have that type of power. So what good am I doing, really? Hmm. Let's see if we can find an answer to that question in Luke chapter 4 this morning. As we continue on in Luke chapter 4, we're going to finish this chapter. And what we've been seeing here in the last little bit with Jesus starting his ministry, uh, verse 36, uh, Luke chapter 4, uh, amazement came upon all them, and they began to talking to one another, saying, what is this message? For with authority and power, he commands unclean spirits, and they come out. And the report about him was spreading into every locality in the surrounding area. So Jesus, we saw, had uh, cast demons out of people. And the, the power and authority of his message was becoming real. 
Uh, verse 38, and then he got up and he left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now, Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked him to help her. And standing over him, her, he rebuked the fever, and it left her, and she immediately got up and waited on them. While the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and laying his hands on each one of them, he, he was healing them. Demons also were coming out of many, shouting, You are the Son of God! But rebuking them, he would not allow them to speak, because they knew he to be the Christ. When Jesus came, Jesus, when the day came, Jesus left and went to a secluded place. The crowds were searching for him and came to him, tried to keep him from going away from them. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. So he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. So this is all that was happening, as we learned last week in Capernaum. All these things were happening there. Uh, last week we saw Jesus who actually has power performing miracles by simply speaking, commanding evil spirits to come out of people, and those spirits obeyed him. The example of his authority and a power is continued on with these next couple verses, verses 38 to 40, 44 this morning. Uh, the example, of course, here with Jesus um, healing Simon, and what's Simon's other name in Scripture? Peter, Peter's mother-in-law, right? So Peter's mother-in-law here, uh, she's struggling with this uh, fever, and then he raises her, or, and then immediately she gets up, it says here, and starts waiting on them. I, I, I remember shortly after I'd arrived to Faith Bible Church, uh, Ron Thompson was in the midst of dealing with some major back issues. And here we are again. It's like uh, history repeating itself, isn't it, Ron? But uh, he had back surgery, and he was trying to recover, and I didn't know Ron real well, but I went up to visit him at the house. And throughout the conversation, he's sitting there in his room, in, in the, in, uh, up in his room, he's laying there in the bed, and Ron says to me, he says, Pastor, when I get well, once God's giving me my strength back, and I get out of this bed, I'm going to serve the church, and I'm going to do whatever you need. And I thought, well, that would be nice, but we'll see. You know, because I've had lots of people tell me through the years all the things that they would and could do, but you tend to temper your enthusiasm until you see someone actually follow through. But sure enough, Ronald was true to his word. And once he got back on his feet, he started in with our lawn care ministry, and he was doing all the yard work for us. After one of our elders moved away to New Mexico, I asked Ron if he would step up and help me with the men's ministry. And once again, Ronald was true to his word, and he began leading the men's ministry, uh, taking over the men's breakfast, organizing the big church fellowships like our Easter breakfast, our church picnics, our bonfires, did some sons and guns, some other cool things like that. And uh, then when we got into our new building here, we had these more intricate mechanical systems, and because of his expertise, I asked Ronald if he'd be overseeing the uh, mechanical systems. And uh, there were times when we first were trying to get the system running right. I'd call Ron up. I said, Ron, the heat's not working. You know, we need help with this. Ron, the AC's not working. Help, get over here, fix this. We're too hot, we're too cold. All the women are freezing in church. You remember these days, right? It's too cold, it's too hot. And we would call Ronald, and he would always come by and uh, fix, deal with it. And, you know, probably Ronald's not going to get up here and preach a sermon anytime soon. And I bet you there's probably folks here this morning that couldn't even pick him out of the crowd. But Ronald is one of many, many, many examples of people that I could talk about who work and serve behind the scenes to make Faith Bible Church run effectively. And the reason why I told you about Deacon Ronald is because of the promise, the commitment he made to me many years ago. He said, Pastor, once the Lord gets me back on my feet, I'm going to serve. And we see the same thing happening here in Luke chapter 4. Once Jesus raised Peter's mother-in-law up, once he restored her back to health, immediately she got up and she served them. She waited on them. That's a reasonable response, don't you think? If someone did something good for you and helped you and got you out of a tight spot, gave you, it gave to you in your time of need, it's natural to feel a sense of gratitude and indebtedness. Wow, I really appreciate the help that you gave me in my time of need. The least I could do in return is, name it. What, what do you need? I will help. This woman was suffering, it tells us, greatly with fever. Now, knowing a mother, for her to be in so bad a shape that she 
her son-in-law would ask for help, she had to be really bad, right? I, 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 moms can fight through and with all kind, deal with all kinds of pain and suffering. I've seen my wife have a C-section, have uh, her stomach cut open, and within hours carrying around a nine-pound, six-ounce baby up and down the hall, comforting that child, trying to get him to stop crying. I've seen my wife ignore all kinds of pain to be true to her word. Uh, she's way tougher than I am, way tougher. Back pain from a car accident, went to work. Broke her foot first day of school, went to work. Had a bacteria eat the inside of lining of her stomach for a few months, never missed a day of work. So moms are tough as nails. But Peter's mother is suffering so bad, her son-in-law's concerned. So I think she has to be on death's door. We can see all around us that fever is nothing to be dismissive about, it, right? People die of the flu. We hear that on the news, this coronavirus thing that's going on. A great fever, right? People are, are struggling with those things. That's not, this is not a common cold. So Jesus went in, what's to say? That he rebuked a fever, left her, and immediately... She gets up, and she's waiting on them. So the fact that she got up immediately and starts waiting on them is evidence that the fever obeyed Jesus, right? She didn't get better gradually. Her immune system didn't naturally fight the sickness off. No, this healing is so instantaneous that she immediately gets up and goes back to that mom thing, right? Here, let me fix you something to eat. Reminds me of Ileana's grandmother, we were coming down from Canada one summer for a vacation. We stopped in New York City to pick up Grandma to take her to Virginia with us. And we go to her apartment to get her and get her stuff. And she's like, I made you food. You need to sit down and eat. Now, I am at this moment in hammer down mode. You know what hammer down mode is, right? This is a McNutt expression. My dad always says, uh, he always uses this to describe an activity that you're doing with great intensity to get the job done as soon as possible when you're going at something really hard. So when you're on a long road trip and you want to bang it out as quick as possible and we're only stopping for gas, if you need to pee, you're going to pee when we stop for gas, right? That's it. No brakes. That's hammer down mode. You can use that. You write that one down, okay? We're driving through New York City and the traffic's moving. You don't want to stop. Right? Because if you stop for too long, all of a sudden it's rush hour traffic. And so we come into New York City, and I'm, I'm in full hammer down mode. And I'm not hungry. I just want to load Grandma into the back seat and get right back on the road. But Grandma's not leaving the apartment until we go May. Right? Because that's what Grandma does. Doesn't matter that she has to pack. Doesn't matter that she has to clean the kitchen because you don't want to leave it a mess for the, the couple weeks she's going to be away. Or that we get a six-hour drive. No. First and foremost, what's most important to her is she gives us something to eat. She has to serve us. Eliana says to me, you know, we're going to have to eat something, right? And I'm like, okay, fine. I'm going to eat because I don't want to be rude. <laughs> yeah, that's how I eat, right? Real fast. But I didn't eat enough because she ate. She made so much. So she takes the pot full of food and sits it on her lap for six hours and takes it to Virginia so she can give it to the rest of the family. Because everyone is going to get served. That's what grandmas do, right? And that's how I see Jesus' mother-in-law. Jesus heals her. She's feeling great. Immediately, she kicks into mom mode. Jesus, sit down. Peter, tell the boys to sit down. I'm going to make them get the apron on. You know, I'm going to make everyone a meal. And she does this because that's who she is. And she does this because she feels, since Jesus has raised me up, the least I can do is serve him. And I know that that resonates with so many of you in here today because so many of you do the exact same thing that Ronald did. You didn't make me the promise, but nevertheless, your actions tell me exactly what happened. God saved my life. Jesus saved my soul. The Lord has saved my marriage. The Lord healed me. I was broke and I had nothing, but God made a way and he provided. The Lord has blessed me with so much. What can I say? What could I do but offer this heart, O oh God, completely to you? Which is exactly what Paul says in Romans chapter 12. 
It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice. I know I'm King James when it's not King James, but that's how I remember it. Holy and acceptable unto God. This is your reasonable. This is your spiritual service. When you consider all that God has done, it's only reasonable to give ourselves to God, to serve him. And I just want to say to you all, thank you. Because you all do so much. You give so much. And you care so much. I'm so blessed to serve in a church where people care about the gospel, care about building the kingdom of God, care about serving the body of Christ, care about reaching the lost, care about the word. I, I preached a kind of an in-your-face message last week, and I thought, well, probably you can get some people upset at me for this one. And uh, all I heard was, thank you, Pastor. We needed to hear that. We just needed that challenge. And, you know, I, I was just preaching it because I needed the challenge. It, the Holy Spirit had convicted me, and sometimes I'm just stubborn about admitting when I'm wrong. So it was just really, I was getting out myself. But I'm so thankful to be in a place where people are honest about their faults and their failures and humble to submit to the word of God. You are people who understand that life is not about me. It's about serving the Savior. Because after all, this is what Jesus modeled for us, right? He spent his whole life serving others and proclaiming the gospel. Verse number 40, while the sun was setting, after those who were sick with various diseases were brought to him, and he laid hands on each one, and he was healing them. Demons were coming out of many, shouting, You are the Son of God! But rebuking them, he would not allow them to speak, because they knew him to be the Christ. Why do you think Jesus wouldn't let the demons speak? After all, weren't they telling the truth? Isn't he the son of God? I think it's the same reason why often our politicians will disavow certain groups that are offering them an endorsement. If a politician says he's for gun restrictions and removing the Second Amendment from the Constitution, but then the NRA said we endorse this candidate for president, people would go, wait, what? Why? Why would you endorse someone who is opposite your stance unless you know something that they're not telling us? Hmm. If a pro-life candidate gets a strong endorsement from Planned Parenthood, we'd think that doesn't make sense unless he's not as pro-life as he's claiming to be. So the candidate would need to clarify, I, I do not accept the NRA's endorsement. I'm not on their side. I, I, I do not accept Planned Parenthood's endorsement. I, I disavow everything they stand for. I will not help their cause in any way, shape, or form. I will shut them down ASAP. Demons are notorious liars. They are unclean spirits. Jesus is disavowing the demons. He's refusing to allow them to speak anything about him because all that would do is create confusion. Even if they are telling the truth in this moment, it's of no benefit to Jesus, to themselves, or to anyone else. Demons can't be saved. Their fate is sealed. They had a time to profess Jesus as Lord. It was when they were before the throne of God, before the fall. They witnessed creation. They experienced the glory and the splendor of heaven. They were honored to be in the service of the King of kings and Lord of lords and commissioned to sing his praises for all of eternity. But a time came when they rebelled and they chose pride over truth, fiction over fact, selfish desires over created purpose. They rejected their creator and thus forfeited their position to be his messengers, his spokesperson. No longer are they permitted to sing his praises or proclaim who he is. Their fate is sealed and Jesus disavows anything about them. Something to think about. Don't make the same mistake. This is our time to sing praise to Jesus, to declare, to testify, to proclaim his name, to shout his fame. We have this opportunity. What a privilege it is. Based on who Jesus is and all that he's done, it is our reasonable service. And yet often people choose pride over truth, fiction over fact, selfish desire over created purpose, just like the demons. I started in the ministry in 1993, and I'm still in awe of the fact that I do this for a living. What an honor. What a privilege. My biggest fear about resigning my positions back in Canada 
was, what if God doesn't let me be a pastor again? There's no guarantee anybody would hire me and let me do this. And when Faith Bible Church gave, gave me the call and said, yeah, we'll take a chance on the crazy Canadian, I, I cried. I cried. Because I'm not worthy of this position. I don't take this for granted. This is, to quote Brother Dick Nevola, better than I deserve. But this is our time to sing praise to Jesus, to declare and testify, proclaim his name, shout his fame. Don't let the devil entice you away. Don't be like those demons who forfeit their position and then get disavowed. I've showed you this warning before. It's a fearful fact. Matthew chapter 10, Jesus says, Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess them before my Father in who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Jesus will disavow those who deny him. It's too late once you get to heaven. Just like it was too late for the demons once they were cast out of heaven and onto earth. That was their time. They lost it. This is our time to declare Jesus is the Son of God. The psalmist says, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord in the sanctuary. Praise the Lord in the mighty expanse. Praise him with the mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him on the trumpet sound. Praise him on the harp and lyre. Praise him with the trembles and dancing. Praise him in, with stringed instruments and pipes. Praise him with loud cymbals. I know you like that one, Tony. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Is he not worthy of our praise? It is our reasonable service. Verse number 42, the dame came when Jesus left and went to a secluded area, and the crowds were searching, came to him, tried to keep him from going away from them, but he said, I must preach the kingdom of God to all to the other cities also. For I was sent for this purpose. All the good that Jesus did, Jesus had the power and the authority to do all these miracles, and yet that wasn't his purpose. Think about it. He did all this good for all of these people, so much so that they don't even want him to leave Capernaum. Of course not. Probably somebody is going to get sick in another day or two, right? All of a sudden that flu bug is going to kick back in. Probably someone's going to be trapped in sin and need to be rescued. Someone's going to die and we're going to want them resurrected. Jesus, just stay here and keep doing good things for us. But he's pulling away because the purpose isn't to do miracles. The purpose is what? Verse 43, I must preach the kingdom of God for I was sent for this purpose. Preach the kingdom of God. The miracles were only being done to validate his message, but the miracles were not the message. Yes, it would be nice to have power to do miracles and cure all the sickness and relieve all the pain and cast out all the demons and conjure up all the money and resources, fix all the marriages, solve all the problems, win every game, provide good things for my church family. But that's not the good news. That's not the gospel message. The gospel is Jesus is Lord he died on the cross to save you from your sins, to forgive you. If you trust in him, you will have eternal life and you will reign forever in his eternal kingdom. That's what I have to offer. Not your best life now, not fleeting riches of this world, not pleasures of this life that are but a vapor and here for a moment and gone. No, what we offer is the kingdom of God. You serve now. You're an ambassador now, a witness, obey now, sacrifice now, suffer now, maybe even die now. Believe now. If you do, you will reap a reward later. Listen to what was said about Jesus in Revelation chapter 5. They sang a new song. This is up in heaven. They said, worthy are you to take the book and break the seal, for you were slain, purchased of God with your blood from every tribe and tongue, people and nation. You have made them. Who? Who has he made? People, men from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. You've made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. They will reign upon the earth. All who are redeemed by the blood of Jesus are part of the kingdom and priests to our God who will reign forever with Jesus in that kingdom. Is that good enough? Is the gospel good enough? I wonder. I thought about this song. I sing this around here sometimes. 
You are my supply, my breath of life, still more awesome than I know. You are my reward, worth living for, still more awesome than I know. All of you is more than enough for all of me, for every thirst and every need. You satisfy me with your love, and all I have in you is more than enough. That's the good that we have to keep doing, is taking that gospel and that hope of eternity to people to show them what the kingdom of God is all about. Lord, we just pray that you would help us. There's been a lot of uh, prayers this morning for struggles and pain and suffering and brokenness and how we wish we could just fix it all. But Lord, that is not what the plan is. The plan is eternal reward, a heavenly home. We suffer, we struggle, we're in trials and tribulations for a little while, but then on the other side, joy comes in the morning. Lord, may we hold true to that message. May we continue to declare that truth. May we be faithful through whatever we're going through to know that on the other side, you will provide all these great blessings. And may that be enough for each and every struggling person, each and every hurting person, each and every discouraged person to know that there is a coming a day when this is all going to be put away, no more sickness, sadness, sorrow, mourning, it all passes away in that new kingdom. May we fix our eyes upon you, Jesus, and follow your example. You went all the way to the cross and suffered. May we be willing to take up our cross and follow you. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.